right, good evening. If you have your Bibles, turn to the book of 1 Peter, chapter 5. 1 Peter, chapter 5. When I was in high school, there were two men uh, who were both great worship leaders. They both lived in Alabama, and they led worship for many of our camps and retreats uh, when I was in high school. And they pretty quickly became well-known and started leading worship at bigger and bigger events. And these two men, they were actually good friends, and they lived in the same area, and they decided to open a Christian coffee shop together as well. But unbeknownst to pretty much everybody, both of these two men at about the same time started to give in to temptations of pride and greed and fame, and they both strayed away from the Lord. But they kept on leading worship all the same. Now, eventually, both of their worlds came crashing down when it was discovered that both of them had been having an affair with the same young lady employee at their coffee shop. Their families, their churches, their ministries were devastated. Now, I knew both of these men, not well, but I knew them well enough to know that I don't believe that either one of them desired from the beginning to become such hypocrites. I don't think that either one of them decided from the beginning that they wanted to wreak this kind of havoc on their families and on their churches. I think that both of them started a slow slide of neglecting their personal devotion time with the Lord and then continuing in the slide to where they were, they were not practicing what they were preaching. They weren't living what they were proclaiming through their worship. No Christian is above falling into temptation. It's only by the grace of God that all of us here, myself included, haven't done awful things that landed us behind bars. We all have that capability within us, in our sin nature. But how crushing is it when pastors and ministers are the ones who fall? How depressing is it when men who are looked up to as godly turn out to be anything but... Now, tonight, we're talking about the importance of practicing what you preach, and we're starting into chapter 5 of the book of 1 Peter. We've been, uh, the last couple of times, we've been looking at the blessing of suffering, even though that sounds like an oxymoron. But We've been looking at how Peter was encouraging these Christians who were at the beginning of about 200 years of intense persecution that the church was going to endure And he was encouraging them that their suffering for Jesus was actually a blessing. Now here at the start of chapter 5, Peter turns his attention to the role of pastors in these churches where the persecution is intensifying. When the church begins to be persecuted, who are usually the first ones to be targeted? Typically, it's the pastors, the leaders. It's normally who has gone after first. And so Peter has some encouragement for these pastors to practice what they preach, because not only are they going to face suffering, but they have to be prepared to pastor their churches through suffering. And so Peter calls them to set the example To set the example, to practice what they preach, and that's the title of the message tonight, Practice What You Preach. Now, this section is clearly written to encourage pastors, and I know there are only a few of us pastors that are in the room tonight, but I want to encourage you that this is important for all of us. Let me give you at least two reasons why. Number one, the church, you. The church is responsible to help hold pastors accountable for doing what God calls them to do. This text that we're going to read tonight is actually given to the church about pastors. 
It's not given directly to the pastors. And then you have three entire books of the Bible that are the same way. Three entire books of the Bible that tell the whole church what pastors are supposed to be and what pastors are supposed to do. It's like God is saying, hey, church, listen in on what pastors are called to do in relationship to you. And then secondly, I really believe that these principles are beneficial for all leaders, all Christian leaders, not just pastors. And I promise you that tonight, I believe that you can apply some of these same principles to your own life, whatever leadership role God has given to you. So with that, let's jump into 1 Peter chapter 5. If you haven't noticed, there's only five chapters in 1 Peter, so our study is winding down. Let's read the first four verses together. It says, I exhort the elders among you as a fellow elder and witness to the sufferings of Christ, as well as one who shares in the glory about to be revealed. Shepherd God's flock among you, not overseeing out of compulsion, but willingly, as God would have you, not out of greed for money, but eagerly, not lording it over those entrusted to you but being examples to the flock. And when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the unfading crown of glory. Great passage. Now remember from the opening of the letter that Peter's writing to Christians in several different regions. He says in the region of Pontus and Galatia and Cappadocia and Asia and Bithynia. And so now Peter is encouraging the elders, the leaders of these churches in these regions. Now, in the Bible, we see various words to describe pastors. Pastors are referred to as overseers or elders, like in this passage, or shepherds. Now, these words are basically interchangeable, but I believe that each one of them highlights a different aspect of the office. The term elder refers to maturity. The term overseer refers to leadership. And the word shepherd refers to the feeding of the church. You might also notice here in verse 1 that elder is plural. It's plural because the ideal setup of church leadership, according to the New Testament, is a plurality of elders. That means multiple pastors. There are many reasons for that, but some of the more obvious reasons are to help keep one man from straying into unbiblical, heretical ideas, to help provide balance, to provide variety of gifts and abilities, to provide continuity when one pastor is out or has to leave. Let me ask you this. Have you ever noticed that some pastors don't take critiques very well? (laughs) No. It's especially hard for a pastor to have someone telling him how to pastor that's never been a pastor. And so what Peter wisely does here as he starts into this section where he's going to give these pastors some encouragement, he provides them again with his credentials. He wants to ensure that he has credibility with these pastors so that his encouragement to them will be well received. And so verse 1, he says, I exhort the elders among you as a fellow elder and a witness to the sufferings of Christ, as well as one who shares in the glory about to be revealed. Now, Peter is an apostle, right? Peter was with Jesus. He saw Jesus. He stated this in chapter 1, verse 1 of this letter. That's his credentials. He's an apostle. But he doesn't come to these pastors flaunting his authority. He doesn't tell them here when he's referring to his credentials, hey, remember, I'm an apostle, so listen up to what I have to tell you. He could do that because he has that authority as an apostle, but he doesn't. Instead, he comes to them with an exhortation. He doesn't even give them a command here. He gives them an exhortation, which is an encouragement. And then he identifies himself as a fellow elder. And so he's not being domineering over these pastors. He's coming alongside of them. He's saying, hey, I'm one of you. 
I'm with you in the trenches of ministry. I understand the struggle. I understand the spiritual warfare. Then Peter identifies himself as one who witnessed firsthand the sufferings of Jesus. Now, this clearly does identify Peter as an apostle with authority, but his point here is deeper than that. You see, the New Testament doesn't actually tell us that Peter witnessed Jesus' crucifixion. Remember, he denies Christ, and then he runs off, and we don't know exactly what he did after that. But it very well could be, and I would tend to agree with this assessment, that this verse is Peter's testimony that he did indeed see the crucifixion of Jesus. Maybe he was watching from a distance. But regardless, Peter witnessed at least some of the sufferings of Jesus. But the point here is that Peter's assuring these elders, these pastors, that he's in the suffering with them. And then lastly, Peter says he's a partaker of the coming glory, the glory of Jesus that's about to be revealed, the glory of Jesus that every person will see at his return. But only those in Christ will share in it. And on that day, every eye will behold his infinite glory. And every tongue will confess him as Lord. And every knee will bow down to him in worship. Now remember, Peter has already glimpsed this glory himself. On the Mount of Transfiguration where he and James and John got a sneak peek at the unveiled glory of Jesus. And do you remember what happened to them when the veil was pulled back a little bit and they saw Jesus in his glory? Matthew 17, it says they fell over like dead men. Here and all throughout the book, we see this theme of suffering and then glory. We see it right here in this verse. Peter repeats it over and over and over again throughout this entire epistle. The hope through the suffering, the hope through the persecution is the glory of Jesus. But there's something really neat that's going on here in verse 1, and it's easy to miss. But Peter is exemplifying everything that he's calling the elders to do before he actually calls them to do it. You'll see this more clearly as we walk through the rest of this text tonight, but the bottom line is this, is that leaders lead by example. They practice what they preach. So Peter shows us three aspects of the role of a pastor. First, we see a pastor's exhortation. A pastor's exhortation. Verse 2 starts, it says, shepherd God's flock among you. Shepherd God's flock among you. So the exhortation that Peter gives here to the elders, to the pastors, is to shepherd God's flock. Now one hurdle that we have to overcome almost 2,000 years after Peter wrote this is that none of us here tonight are shepherds. And I would be willing to guess that none of you in here even know a shepherd. The closest we get to sheep normally today is at the zoo. So shepherding analogies and shepherding terminology can get a little bit lost on some of us today. So what does it mean to shepherd? The primary role of a shepherd is to make sure that the sheep are fed. To find a place with grass, with water, to protect them from predators so that they can eat, they can have nourishment. If you look at everything that a shepherd does, it's built on this main responsibility, to get the sheep fed so that they can mature. And this is the analogy that God has chosen for pastoring, that pastors are to shepherd the sheep by feeding them. In John chapter 21, the passage that Brother Eddie preached this past Sunday, as Jesus restores Peter after his threefold denial, Jesus asked Peter three times, he used a little different phrasing as Brother Eddie pointed out, but Jesus asked Peter three times if he loves him. And after each of Peter's responses, what does Jesus tell him to do? Jesus says, in a little different phrasing, But he says, feed my 
sheep. Now hear me tonight. Administration, that's one of my gifts. Administration, creativity, marketing, charisma, all of those things can be helpful in ministry for a pastor. But the focus of pastoring is to feed the sheep. Pastors that become more like CEOs than shepherds are missing the point. A pastor that's not feeding the sheep through teaching and preaching of the Word of God isn't really a pastor. Think about it. The entire office of a deacon was created so that pastors could focus on prayer and the ministry of the Word, according to Acts chapter 6. That's how important this is. So again, here and all throughout the Bible, we as the church are referred to as sheep. (laughs) What does it mean that we are like sheep? I'll tell you, it's not good. (laughs) Let me give you three things. They all start with D, so maybe you can remember them. That makes it easier for me. Sheep are directionless. Sheep are the only animal in the world that can be totally lost when only a short distance from home. They have no instinct for directions. Now, Candace and I have owned two different homes, and both of those homes have served as homes to squirrels as well as to our family. Thankfully, we've rid both houses of them. But people say that if you capture a squirrel and you decide not to exterminate it, But if you capture a squirrel and you're going to release it, that you better take it at least 10 miles away from your home, or you know what will happen? That squirrel will eventually find its way back. I've heard stories about dogs, that a dog chased a biker like 10 miles down the road to some lake, and the, the family thought the dog was lost forever, and then eventually, took the dog weeks, but eventually... The dog came back scratching at that door. Sheep are not like squirrels. Sheep are not like dogs. They cannot find their way home. Isaiah 53, 6 says that we all went astray like sheep. We all have turned to our own way, and the Lord has punished him for the iniquity of us all. And so without Jesus, we have no direction in life. We're lost. We're without purpose. And the only direction that we know without Jesus is to simply follow our sinful nature that will lead you right over a cliff. So sheep are directionless. Secondly, sheep are dependent. Have you ever been to a circus? You see lots of different trained animals at at a circus. You see elephants. Many times you see them standing on their back legs on tiny little stools, which is impressive. You can even see monkeys riding bicycles sometimes. You can see lions jumping through rings of fire. Very entertaining. But have you ever seen a sheep at a circus? No. (laughs) Because sheep can't be trained to do much of anything. And no one wants to pay money to watch a sheep wander around aimlessly. They're simply led by their appetite for food and really nothing else. You know, we're the same way. We're helpless on our own. We're dominated by our appetite for sin unless someone comes to rescue us. We are totally dependent. We desperately need a Savior. And then lastly, sheep are defenseless. Sheep are defenseless. Have you ever heard of a sheep fighting? No, because sheep don't fight. They can't fight. They have no defense against predators. Sheep really do define the term dead meat. See, without Jesus, we're completely helpless. We're defenseless against our own sinful nature. We're defenseless against the schemes of the enemy. We are powerless. We are helpless. We are hopeless. And Matthew chapter 9, verse 36 says that when Jesus saw the crowds, he felt compassion for them because they were distressed and dejected like sheep without a shepherd. Now, all of this is important to help us understand what Peter's saying here about the duty of being a pastor. 
It's tough enough to shepherd sheep, but when you add in persecution and attacks and deception from the enemy, it becomes an extremely difficult task. And on on top of all of that, pastors are sheep too. Peter says, shepherd God's flock. God intends that no Christian be a solitary follower of Jesus. We're all called to be part of the flock. Every Christian is called to be a growing, active, serving part of a local, Bible-believing, Bible-preaching church. Every Christian is called to be under the shepherding of the pastors of the church. Some people say, it's just me, the Lord, and my Bible. That's all I need. Well, God says, you don't know what you're talking about. We need each other. We need the church. God wired us for community. Next, I want you to notice that this is God's flock. It's not any pastor's flock. Jesus is the head of the church. He is the chief shepherd. We as pastors are best referred to as under shepherds. We're shepherds that are under the leadership and under the authority of the good shepherd who lays down his life for the sheep. And then lastly, I want you to notice Peter tags on this phrase at the end here. He says, among you. Shepherd God's flock among you. Now, this is important because it shows that there is only one church, big C. Only one people of God. Only one flock of God. But God calls pastors to shepherd the part of the flock that he has entrusted to them. That means that as pastors, we need to be more concerned with the occupied seats than we are with the empty ones. Pastors are to faithfully feed the sheep and then leave the results up to the Lord. We've seen a pastor's exhortation. Secondly, I want you to see a pastor's temptations. A pastor's temptations. Look at verses 2 and 3. Shepherd God's flock among you. Now he's going to tell us how to do it and how not to do it. Not overseeing out of compulsion, but willingly, as God would have you. Not out of greed for money, but eagerly. Not lording it over those entrusted to you, but being examples to the flock. So Peter lists out here three temptations that pastors will experience as leaders of churches. Three temptations that pastors will face as they shepherd God's flock. You know, these are also temptations that all Christian leaders face. And each one of them is deadly for leadership. First one is this, laziness. Laziness. Peter says, not overseeing out of compulsion, but willingly. Now, doing something out of compulsion means that you've been forced to do it, to be pressured, to be coerced. So why would a pastor be forced or pressured into shepherding the church? I think the number one reason is laziness. You see, there are plenty of pastors that work hard who put in more hours than they probably should, who sacrifice so much for the church because they love Jesus and they love the church. But I'm just going to tell you there are plenty others who are just simply lazy. Now, if you need somebody to push you all the time rather than you being motivated by your love for the Lord, by the urgency and the importance of the task that we have, you have a deep, deep problem. Peter says, don't ever get into the situation where somebody's got to come along and push you to do your job. Don't get into a situation where you've got to be forced to do the work of shepherding. Now, how often do you do what is right because you're supposed to? See, the goal for all of us as Christians is that we do what is right because we desire to please the Lord that we work for an audience of one. It doesn't matter who you please if you're not pleasing God. We should do these things willingly, doing them joyfully for the Lord, not because we have to. 
The second one that Peter points out here, the second temptation, is greed. Not out of greed for money, but eagerly. You know one of the most common characteristics of false teachers? It's a love for money. Greed is a surefire way to kill your ministry. See, one of the requirements for pastors in 1 Timothy chapter 3 is not to be a lover of money. Greed disqualifies you. It's a deadly temptation. 1 Timothy chapter 6 verse 10 says, For the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil, and by craving it some have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many griefs. And I love what the Lord says to his prophet back in Ezekiel 34. It says, the word of the Lord came to me, son of man, prophesy against the shepherds of Israel. Prophesy and say to them, this is what the Lord God says to the shepherds. Woe to the shepherds of Israel who have been feeding themselves. Shouldn't the shepherds feed their flock? You eat the fat, you wear the wool, you butcher the fattened animals, but you do not tend the flock. Pastors are tempted to be motivated by greed, charging absurd amounts of money to come and preach. I'll preach for free. (laughs) Changing churches in order to make more money, that's pretty common. Even writing books can sometimes be motivated by greed. You know what the opposite of greed is? It's contentment. Hebrews chapter 13, verse 5 says, Keep your life free from the love of money. Be satisfied with what you have, for he himself has said, I will never leave you or abandon you. I think the writer of Hebrews sums this up perfectly. Be content with what you have in Jesus. That's way more than what we deserve anyway. So whether you make lots of money or you make little money, we're to do what God's called us to do, and we're to do it eagerly. So no matter the size of the paycheck, pastors are to shepherd the flock with eagerness, with gratitude. You see, in the majority of churches, if the pastor is there for the paycheck, he won't last. Because he'll either find another church that's going to pay him more money, or he'll find another type of job where he can make more money. Just think about this for a moment. Think about, can you imagine being so driven by money that you begin to lie and manipulate people in ministry. How messed up are we that we will manipulate or outright steal money away from building the kingdom of God? This happens way too often. I remember back when this came out in 2014, 2014, it was discovered that a man serving with our International Mission Board in Portugal, that he had stolen around $300,000 from International Mission Board funds over the span of several years that he was there. Now, to steal money is wrong, but to steal money that was given to get the gospel to unreach people, that's a whole nother level of evil. Pastors are to serve out of the overflow of their joy in Jesus. To serve is an incredible privilege. No pastor should ever be motivated by financial gain. Then number three, the third temptation, and the biggest one, is pride. Not lording it over those entrusted to you, but being examples to the flock. I don't believe that there is a greater temptation in pastoring than pride. You see, the nature of leadership, the nature of being on stage like I am right now, the nature of being known, it all lends itself to being, to us being tempted to think more highly of ourselves than we should. It's so easy to be swayed by the love of power, the love of prestige. But it is spiritual treason against God for us to feel like we are self-reliant or for us to feel like we are indispensable to the kingdom of God. When we begin to be swayed by pride, we quickly find our leadership style shifting 
from loving and serving sacrificially to more of a style of intimidation and a domineering attitude. You see, the authority of a pastor doesn't come from how big the church that he pastors is. It doesn't come from how many followers on social media he has. It doesn't come from how many and how big the conferences are that he preaches at. The authority of a pastor comes only from the Word of God. In everything else, a pastor should be a servant leader, serving the sheep with tenderness and with care. In Matthew chapter 20, verse 25 and 26, Jesus called over the disciples and said, You know that the rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them. And those in high positions act as tyrants over them. It must not be like that among you. On the contrary, whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant. The opposite of pride is humility. And a pastor should be a humble servant leader. A pastor should be meek in leadership. A pastor should be compassionate to the sheep. And the single greatest test of leadership is an exemplary life. A pastor has to be an example for the sheep, not a prideful tyrant, not someone who intimidates or dominates. I was reading in Acts chapter 14 this morning, actually, and I was reading about Paul and Barnabas, how they were celebrated as gods after they healed a man with crippled feet. Now, I imagine, the text doesn't say it, but I imagine that there was a temptation for Paul and for Barnabas to enjoy that praise and adoration. A temptation maybe for them to think, you know, God used me to do this. Maybe I deserve a little bit of this adoration. Maybe I deserve some of these accolades. Paul and Barnabas did not, if they had that temptation, they did not give in to it. You see, the people continued with their big pagan celebration, and Paul and Barnabas begged them, the text says, they begged them to stop. They knew that glory was not theirs, but the people wouldn't stop. The temptation of the praise of men is a big temptation, but the praise of men is fleeting, because if you keep reading in that chapter, some Jews from another town where Paul and Barnabas had just been, they came to that town and followed Paul and Barnabas, and you know what they were able to do? They were able to completely sway this group of people from worshiping them as gods to now they're stoning them. The Bible says that Paul was stoned and they thought that he was dead. But when you have a pastor who is secure in Christ, who is content in Christ, who is humble in Christ, that's a pastor whose hope is truly in Jesus. That's a pastor who has the joy of Jesus running through his veins. That's a pastor who is not tossed around by the whims of negative church members. A pastor who's not easily discouraged, but a pastor who is steadfast because his identity is found in Jesus. But those pastors who give in to these temptations, those who are driven by laziness or greed or pride, those pastors are giving up their joy. They're full of worldliness. They want money. They want fame. They ultimately want people to make much of them rather than people making much of Jesus. Those are the pastor's temptations that Peter points out. So we've seen the pastor's exhortation, a pastor's temptations, and lastly we see here in verse 4, a pastor's motivation. Verse 4 says, And when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the unfading crown of glory. Now being a pastor is full of challenges, and it's full of heartbreak. And the Bible says that it comes with stricter judgment But hear me tonight, it is a joy like no other. Any truly called pastor wouldn't trade it for the world. 
There are so many blessings, so many rewards that come with pastoring. But the greatest of these rewards is still yet to come. The greatest reward comes when Jesus returns and faithful pastors receive their unfading crown of glory. Now, in ancient times, instead of giving trophies like many people still do today, not so much as when I was young, but instead of giving trophies, they gave crowns. It was a way to honor someone, a way to honor them for their accomplishment or honor them for their achievement. Now, about a month or so ago, we were cleaning out my parents' house, the house that I lived in for most of my childhood, and my boys, Jude and Luke, ended up going through some of my old trophies. (laughs) Most of them were sports trophies, and most of them were from basketball. Some of the trophies were very small, and then some of them were rather large. And Jude and Luke thought it was really cool, so they kept a couple of those trophies. But do you know what I did with the rest of them? I threw them in the trash can. I didn't want them. (laughs) They no longer had any value to me. I wanted them when I got them, at least most of them. (laughs) But years later, they just become junk. The very small glory that they once had was now completely faded away. But this trophy for faithful pastors, this crown of glory, it's not like our normal accomplishments. This crown is unfading. It's an eternal glory. So this is the motivations for pastors to fight against these temptations. This is the motivation for pastors to be faithful, to work hard, to be content, to stay humble. So no matter how much we suffer, no matter how much we sacrifice, no matter how much persecution we endure, it's all going to be worth it when Jesus appears. We can keep on loving. We can keep on shepherding. We can keep on preaching and teaching. We can keep on sacrificing because Jesus is worth it. Now I want you to hear me tonight. Every Christian, every Christian is going to be a part of the judgment seat of Christ a great awards ceremony where we will all be rewarded for what we have done for Jesus. But these rewards that we will get, they're different from typical awards because these rewards are not for our ultimate glory. This crown that pastors receive for being faithful is not for the pastor's ultimate glory. These things, all of these things, all of the rewards that all of us will receive are for Jesus' ultimate glory. So don't get the idea that everybody's going to be looking at you wearing your special crown and praising you for all of your great achievements. That praise belongs to one person, and his name is not you. His name is not me. His name is Jesus. Because the only thing that is good in me and the only thing that is good in you is Jesus. How could we possibly receive glory for something that Jesus did through us? We're simply the vessels. We will be praising and glorifying God for choosing to use sinful people like us. See, our great prize is Jesus himself. He's the motivation for every pastor. He's the motivation for every believer to persevere in faith, to suffer in hope, to repay evil with good. And these crowns, all of these rewards are actually a way for us to give the glory back to him. We deserve hell, not heaven. And we surely don't deserve any awards. Our awards will be used to bring glory to the only one who's worthy. So pastors and all Christians, don't lose heart. Don't give up. Don't fall into temptation. Continue in God's calling for your life. Because listen to me, Jesus is worth it. 
Let me pray for us. God, thank you so much for your word. God, thank you for the promise of these rewards that we have waiting on us. God, thank you that these are not for us to look awesome, but God, they are for us to give back to you and pour out our praise and adoration on you forever and ever and ever. Lord, I know that this message is geared towards pastors, but God, I pray that you would use it in all of our hearts. So Lord, show us what it means to be a true leader, what it means to be a godly example. Lord, the temptations that all of us face as leaders, pastors or not, Lord, that we would not give in to those temptations, that we would take the way out that you promise us in 1 Corinthians. Lord, that we would take that way out, and Lord, that we would glorify you with our actions. Lord, that we would look to you and only you to satisfy our souls, because God, nothing this world offers can do that. Lord, help us to focus on your glory and not our own. Lord, it's all about you. It's not about us. And it's in the great name of Jesus we pray.